All right, thank you for joining us today and attending this online presentation, which is part of Anabios uh, webinar series. My name is Andraghetti. I'm the CEO at Anabios Corporation. Anabios is a unique contract research organization and a biotech company based in San Diego, California. And we are entirely focused on translational research. And all of our work is based on the study of physiology, pharmacology, and pathology of human cells and tissues. We do not employ stem cell derived models, but instead rely on organs and tissues recovered from ethically consented donors. And we use these tissues and cells to study drug activity in human ex vivo preparations and study uh, endpoints that generate data that are predictive of potential efficacy and safety of novel drug candidates. So we have truly redefined first in human. And in essence, working with Anabios is as close as you can get to a clinical trial without actually running a clinical trial. Now, um, before introducing today's speaker, I would like to take a moment to invite uh, everyone attending today's webinar to our next webinar, which will be on October 29 in which uh, Dr. Levijoki will discuss research directed at the development of new treatment for heart failure. So today it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Amy Rumora. Dr. Rumora completed her bachelor degree in biochemistry at Mount Holyoke College and her PhD in biochemistry at the University of Vermont. She is currently postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Eva Feldman's laboratory at the University of Michigan, where she studies the impact of dietary fatty acids on nerve functions in pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes. She is the recipient of numerous grants and awards, including an NIH T32 postdoctoral fellowship in basic diabetes research, uh, a Ruth uh, Kirstein National Research Service Award, and a K99R00 Pathway to Independence Award from the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive, and Kidney Disease. Today, she will talk about the differential effects of saturated and monounsaturated fatty um, We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, and all of you can submit questions using the chat box uh, at the bottom right of the webinar window. Uh, you can submit uh, questions at any time during the presentation or during the Q&A session, but Dr. Rumora will answer the questions only at the end. Uh, Amy, uh, take it from here. Awesome. Thank you very much for that um, very kind introduction, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. So today I will be telling you about our studies evaluating the differential effect of saturated and monounsaturated fatty acids on nerve function in mirroring models of prediabetes. I'll first give a brief background and then I'll discuss the effect of dietary fatty acid composition on nerve function. And then I will talk a little bit about the molecular effect of saturated and monounsaturated fatty acids on mitochondrial function and dynamics in sensory neurons. And then during the second part of my talk, I will delve into some of our ongoing studies where we're evaluating lipids and metabolites that are associated with peripheral neuropathy in both our mirroring models of prediabetes as well as in um, patients with type 2 diabetes. So diabetes is the largest global epidemic of the 21st century. It affects more than 463 million adults worldwide. This number accounts for more than 9.3% of the world's population that has diabetes, and this number is thought to increase to 11% within the decade. As you can see, developed countries such as the United States have the highest prevalence of diabetes, accounting for more than 20 million cases, and the, the majority of these cases are type 2 diabetes. This is likely due to the recent rise in obesity. Obesity is a major risk factor for type 2 diabetes. And as you can see, over the past 30 years, there's been a large increase in the prevalence of obesity in the United States. In 1994, less than 14% of the population uh, was considered obese. 
and by 2015, more than 26% of the population was considered obese. What's interesting is the prevalence of diabetes closely parallels this increase in obesity, suggesting that obesity may be a driving factor in the progression of type 2 diabetes. Obesity is also a risk factor for prediabetes, which is a condition that precedes type 2 diabetes and is characterized by elevated blood glucose levels and impaired glucose tolerance that is not yet at the level of a type 2 diabetic patient. What's even more shocking than the number of individuals with type 2 diabetes are the number of individuals with prediabetes. In the United States alone, 84.1 million adults have prediabetes. That's more than one out of every three adults. What's worse is that nine out of 10 of these individuals don't know that they have prediabetes, and this is because prediabetes is typically asymptomatic. This is problematic because if an individual knows that they have prediabetes, they can undergo certain lifestyle interventions such as eating healthy or leading a more active lifestyle, and this can prevent or slow the progression of prediabetes to type 2 diabetes. What's interesting is many of the same tissue-specific complications that occur in type 2 diabetes also occur in prediabetes. The most common complication of prediabetes and diabetes is peripheral neuropathy. This occurs in approximately 30% of prediabetic patients and 50% of diabetic patients. Patients with peripheral neuropathy experience a loss of sensation in their limbs that occurs due to axonal degeneration that occurs in a distal to proximal progression. Patients with neuropathy have a very low quality of life. They experience pain and eventual loss of sensation in their limbs, and this can lead to severe morbidity and even amputation of the limb. Unfortunately, there are no disease-modifying treatments for peripheral neuropathy associated with prediabetes or type 2 diabetes, but recent studies from our lab and others have shown that the progression of peripheral neuropathy correlates with dyslipidemia, and this suggests that dietary fatty acids may play a role in the progression of neuropathy. Today I'll discuss three major parts of the peripheral nervous system, the dorsal root ganglion, the sciatic nerve, and the sural nerve. The dorsal root ganglion is located just outside of the spinal cord, and it houses the cell bodies of the primary dorsal root ganglion sensory neurons, or DRG neurons. DRG neurons extend axons up to meters in length from the spinal cord to the peripheral nerves. And the responsibility of these neurons is to um, transmit sensory information back to the central nerve sy nervous system. The sciatic nerve and sural nerve are composed of bundles of axons, as you can see in this cross section here. And as type 2 diabetes progresses, you can see that you have a loss of axons within the nerves. We measure nerve dysfunction in two different gold standard ways. We use nerve conduction velocity, which evaluates the speed and strength of nerve conduction. And we also evaluate intraepidermal nerve fiber density within the foot pads of our mouse models. And that allows us to determine whether there's a loss of nerve fibers in the, in the foot pads of these mice. In order to evaluate the effect of dietary fatty acids, we use murine models of obesity and prediabetes. But don't worry, we don't feed these mice snacks and chocolate. Instead, we feed them a high-fat diet that's composed of 60% lard, and this mimics the Western diet. So as you can see, these mice that are fed the 60% high-fat diet become quite greasy and are much larger than their standard diet-fed counterparts. These mice also develop prediabetes compared to the standard diet-fed mice. And they have many of the same prediabetic phenotypes that a prediabetic human would have. They have an increase in body weight, an elevated fasting blood glucose level, and they also have an increased percent body fat mass compared to the standard diet-fed mice. These high-fat diet-fed mice also develop peripheral neuropathy when we feed them the high-fat diet from four weeks of age until 24 weeks of age. As you can see, the high-fat diet-fed mice have impaired motor nerve conduction velocity as well as sensory nerve conduction velocity compared to the standard diet-fed mice. They also have a loss of intraepidermal nerve, fiber nerve fibers within their foot pads compared to the standard diet-fed mice. So prediabetes and obesity is thought to be associated with increased intake of the Western diet. The Western diet is composed of processed foods, fried foods, 
red meats, and all of these tasty high-fat foods. Um, these foods tend to be composed of a high level of saturated fatty acids, or SFAs, as I'll refer to them from here on out. As you can see, SFAs have a linear structure due to a lack of double bond in their acyl carbon chain. The American Diabetes Association recommends supplementing or substituting SFAs for polyunsaturated or monounsaturated fatty acids, or MUFAs as I'll refer to them. MUFAs are found in vegetables and vegetable oils such as avocado or olive oil. And um, as you can see here, they have a kink in their structure due to a single double bond. So there are several studies that have shown that switching SFAs for MUFAs confers metabolic health benefits for patients with prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. However, the effect of MUFAs on neuropathy progression is unknown. So therefore, we wanted to evaluate the effect of SFAs and MUFAs on the development of neuropathy in these pre-diabetic mouse models. To do this, we used a dietary intervention paradigm with three groups of mice. The first group of mice was fed a standard diet from six weeks of age until 24 weeks of age. The second group of mice was fed a SFA-rich high-fat diet from six weeks of age until 24 weeks of age. And the third group was fed the SFA-rich high-fat diet until they developed neuropathy at 16 weeks of age. At this point, these mice were switched to a high-fat diet that's rich in monounsaturated fatty acids, or MUFAs. And at 24 weeks at the termination of the study, we evaluated their metabolic um, phenotypes as well as their neuropathy phenotypes. What we found was that the mice fed a high fat diet throughout the duration of the study, the diet that's rich in saturated fatty acids, had an elevation in body weight compared to the standard diet controls. We also found that the mice fed a high fat diet that were switched to monounsaturated fatty acids also had an increased body weight compared to the standard diet control. We also found that the high-fat diet and high-fat diet MUFA mice had impaired glucose tolerance compared to the standard diet-fed mice. We next wanted to evaluate the effect of these two dietary um, fed groups to determine the effect on the body composition. And what we found was the high-fat diet and high-fat diet MUFA mice had an increase in the percent body fat mass compared to the standard diet fed controls. So what this suggests is that both the high fat diet mice and the high fat diet MUFA mice have impaired metabolic function. We next wanted to evaluate the effect of these two diets on neuropathy progression. And what we found was that the high fat diet fed mice had impaired sensory and motor nerve conduction velocity compared to the standard diet fed mice. What was interesting though, is the third group of mice that was switched to high-fat diet, MUFA, had a significant increase in both sensory and motor nerve conduction velocity compared to the high-fat diet-fed mice. Similarly, we found that there was a significant decrease in intraepidermal nerve fiber density in the high-fat diet-fed mice compared to the controls, but there was a restoration of nerve fibers in the mice that had been switched to high-fat diet, MUFA. So what this suggests is that the mice that were switched to high-fat diet, MUFA, had metabolic dysfunction, but had restored nerve function. So we were really excited about this data, and this led us to ask two important questions. The first was, how does the SFA-rich high-fat diet lead to neuropathy development? And the second question is, how do MUFAs reverse neuropathy progression when these mice are switched to high-fat diet MUFA? To study this on a molecular level, we identified the fatty acids that were highest in both of these diets. So the saturated fatty acids that are highest in the high-fat diet are palmitate and stearate. So as you can see, palmitate has a hydrocarbon chain that's 16 carbons in length and is linear in structure. And stearate has a hydrocarbon chain that's 16, or sorry, 18 carbons in length and is also linear in structure. And the high-fat diet MUFA is primarily composed of, of monounsaturated fatty acid oleate. As you can see, it has the kink in the structure due to the single double bond. So because the mitochondria is the major site of fatty acid beta oxidation, we wanted to evaluate the differential effect of SFAs and MUFAs on mitochondrial dynamics and function. So as you may know, the mitochondria is the primary site of ATP production and is essential for neuronal health and function. The mitochondria produces ATP through oxidative phosphorylation, 
where it passes electrons from NAD, NADH and FADH2 down the electron transport complexes. This generates a uh, mitochondrial membrane potential by pumping protons out into the intermembrane space. These protons can then be pumped through ATP synthase in order to um, generate ATP. And this is known as bioenergetic function. However, if a mitochondria experiences environmental insults, it can, can become dysfunctional. And this can lead to a loss of bioenergetic function, a decrease in the mitochondrial membrane potential, and a loss of ATP production. It can also real, result in an increase in reactive oxygen species and apoptosis. Another important mitochondrial dynamic for DRG sensory neurons is mitochondrial trafficking. And this is because DRG neurons are dependent on mitochondrial-derived ATP, not only in the cell body where these mitochondria are generated, but throughout that entire meter's length of their axon. So DRG neurons employ mitochondrial trafficking mechanisms to transport the mitochondria from the cell body all the way to the distal tip of the axon. They also um, need to transport these mitochondria back towards the cell body. So as you can see, there are some mitochondria moving in an anterograde direction away from the cell body towards the distal tip of the axon, while there are others moving back towards the cell body. And then there are, there's a population of mitochondria that are not moving throughout the duration of this video. So we wanted to evaluate the impact of SFAs and MUFAs on mitochondrial trafficking and function in DRG neurons. In order to do this, we extracted DRG from adult C57 black six mice. We dissociated the DRG into a single cell suspension and plated them on a laminin-coated imaging plate. We then transfected these DRG neurons with mitochondria GFP or mitochondria RFP um, in order to label the mitochondria within the axon. We then treated these DRG neurons for 24 hours with various treatments, including a treatment media control or a BSA vehicle control, which is what we use to get the fatty acids into solution. We can also treat these DRG neurons with physiological concentrations of fatty acids, as well as mixtures of the individual fatty acids. We then capture a two and a half minute time-lapse recording of each neuron, which is composed of 61 still images. We then performing a, perform a chymographing analysis of the time-lapse recording of each neuron in order to evaluate the movement of the mitochondria. In order to do this, we draw a region of interest from the cell body down to the distal tip of the axon, as you can see here. We can then evaluate the movement of the fluorescence intensities from these mitochondria by performing a chymographing analysis. By doing this, we can generate a chymograph of the motile mitochondria, or those that are moving, as well as a stationary chymograph to identify the mitochondria that are not moving throughout the course of the video. As you can see here, we can stack stack each, six, each of the 61 images from the video along the y-axis and along the x-axis, you can see is the distance traveled along the axon. So we can identify mitochondria that are moving in an anterograde direction, such as this mitochondria here, as well as mitochondria that are moving in a retrograde direction, such as this mitochondria here. And we can also identify the mitochondria that are not moving throughout the video. Um, and appear to be a straight line in the chymograph. So we first wanted to evaluate the effect of saturated fatty acids, palmitate and stearate on mitochondrial trafficking in DRG neurons. As you can see in these chymographs, the treatment media and BSA control had little effect on mitochondrial trafficking. There were plenty of mitochondria moving in these chymographs. However, however as we increase the physiological concentration of both palmitate and stearate, you can see that we have a dose-dependent reduction in the number of motile mitochondria in the axon for both palmitate and stearate. And when we quantitated this data, we found that there was a significant decrease in the percent motile mitochondria um, in palmitate treatments ranging from 62.5 to 250 micromolar. Similarly, for stearate, we found that there was a dose-dependent and significant reduction in the percent motile mitochondria in stearate treatments ranging from 31.25 to 250 micromolar stearate. Based on this data, we next wanted to determine whether these saturated fatty acids affect mitochondrial function. So we evaluated the mitochondrial bioenergetic capacity in these DRG neurons using a seahorse analysis. We evaluated spare respiratory capacity, coupling efficiency, and proton leak. 
And what we found was compared to the BSA control shown in purple, the DRD neurons treated with 125 and 250 micromolar palmitate had a dose-dependent reduction in spare respiratory capacity. Since, since spare respiratory capacity is the ability of a cell to produce ATP under increased energy demand, this shows that these DR, the mitochondria in these DRG neurons have a reduction in their bioenergetic capacity and are likely dysfunctional. We also found that there was a reduction in coupling efficiency in the palmitate treated DRG neurons, as well as an increase in proton leak. Since coupling efficiency is essential for retaining that mitochondrial membrane potential, we next wanted to determine whether there was mitochondrial depolarization or a loss of mitochondrial membrane potential in the mitochondria in these DRG neurons. To do this, we used a stain called TMRM, which is a cationic stain that localizes to mitochondria with normal mitochondrial membrane potential. We first labeled our, uh, the mitochondria within the DRG neurons with mitochondria GFP in order to identify the mitochondria. We then treated these DRG neurons with our various fatty acid concentrations, and then we stained these DRG neurons with TMRM. And as you can see in the treatment media control where the mitochondria retain their mitochondrial membrane potential, when we overlay these two images, the mitochondria appear yellow. Similarly, in the 0.25% BSA vehicle control, we found that the mitochondria retain their mitochondrial membrane potential. However, when we treated these DRG neurons with palmitate or stearate, you can see that the TMRM staining becomes much more diffuse, and the green stain shows through much more in the overlay of the two images. So when we quantitated this data, we found that 125 micromolar palmitate and stearate induced a significant depolarization or loss of mitochondrial membrane potential in the mitochondria in these DRG neurons. Since the mitochondrial membrane potential is essential for ATP production, we next wanted to determine whether there were any changes in ATP in DRG neurons treated with these various concentrations of fatty acids. What we found is when we treated these DRG neurons with palmitate, we saw a dose-dependent reduction in ATP level. We also found that there was a dose-dependent reduction in ATP level in the DRG neurons that had been treated with stearate. So based on these studies, we predicted that mice fed a standard diet have a basal level of fatty acids that are transported into the DRG neurons. These fatty acids are then converted into acyl-CoAs and transported into the mitochondria for beta oxidation, the TCA cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation in order to produce ATP. However, in the high-fat diet, an elevated level of palmitate and stearate is likely to cause mitochondrial dysfunction and lipotoxicity by decreasing axonal trafficking within those DRG neurons, leading to a loss of bioenergetic capacity and reducing ATP production. So based on these studies, we next wanted to answer our next question. How does the high-fat diet move a reverse neuropathy progression? In order to do this, we performed many of the same studies, but compared the saturated fatty acid palmitate to the monounsaturated fatty acid oleate found in high-fat diet MUFA. We first evaluated mitochondrial trafficking, and what we found was when we treated the DRG neurons with these various concentrations of monounsaturated fatty acid oleate, you can see that there was no effect on mitochondrial trafficking in the axons of these DRG neurons. Again, when we treated these fatty acids with palmitate, as expected, we again saw a dose-dependent decrease in the percent motile mitochondria in the axons of palmitate-treated DRG neurons. We next wanted to ask the question, what happens if we mix MUFA oleate and SFA palmitate together? And how will that affect the mitochondrial trafficking in the DRG axons? So as you can see in these videos on the left, the DRG neurons that were treated with palmitate alone had a significant impairment of mitochondrial trafficking in the axons of these DRG neurons. So this is a video and you can see that there are barely any mitochondria moving within the axons. However, when we take that same exact concentration of palmitate and mix it with an equal molar concentration of oleate, you can see that we can prevent the impairment of mitochondrial trafficking within the axons of these DRG neurons. And when we quantitate this data, we find that the palmitate alone, again, caused a significant reduction in the percent motile mitochondria within the axons of these DRG neurons compared to the treatment media and BSA control. 
However, when we mix oleate and palmitate together at a one-to-one -one and two-to-one ratio, we can completely prevent that inhibition of mitochondrial trafficking in the palmitate treatments alone. So we were really excited about this data, and we next wanted to determine whether we could use oleate as a type of treatment in these DRG neurons to restore mitochondrial trafficking after it had been inhibited by palmitate. To do this, we used a pre- and post-treatment experiment. So we pre-treated the DRG neurons for 12 hours with palmitate. After 12 hours, we removed the palmitate, washed the cells twice, and then added the oleate in for a post-treatment for 12 hours. And after the total of 24 hours, we evaluated mitochondrial trafficking. What we found is compared to the treatment media and BSA control, after just 12 hours of palmitate treatment, we still saw a significant reduction in the percent motile mitochondria of these DRG neurons. However, when we pre-treated with palmitate and post-treated with oleate at a one-to-one -one or two-to-one ratio, we found that we could completely rescue mitochondrial trafficking with this, within these DRG neurons. We next wanted to determine whether we could reverse this experiment and pre-treat with oleate and then post-treat with palmitate to prevent the future inhibition of mitochondrial trafficking. And what you can see is that at a one-to-one -one or two-to-one ratio, we did have some restoration of mitochondrial trafficking, but it was not significant. So we next wanted to determine the effect of oleate on the mitochondrial membrane potential. And so again, we used our TMRM stain. And what we found is similar to the previous studies, we found in the treatment media control, there was still punctate staining of TMRM within the axons of these DRG neurons. Again, we found when we treated these DRG neurons with 125 micromolar palmitate, there was a significant loss of TMRM staining within the axons of these DRG neurons. Interestingly, when we treated the cells with oleate alone, we found that we were able to retain the mitochondrial membrane potential in, these, in the mitochondria of these DRG neurons. And even more interesting, when we mixed the oleate and palmitate together at a one-to-one -one ratio, we could retain mitochondrial membrane potential despite the presence of palmitate. When we quantitated this, we found that compared to palmitate alone, where there was a significant increase in the percent depolarized mitochondria, oleate alone did not cause mitochondrial depolarization. And when oleate and palmitate were mixed together at a one-to-one -one ratio, we could completely prevent the mitochondrial depolarization caused by palmitate alone. We next, again, wanted to evaluate the ATP level. And what we found was that monounsaturated fatty acid oleate had no impact on the ATP level in these DRG neurons compared to the BSA control. When we looked at palmitate treatments, we again saw a dose-dependent and significant decrease in ATP in these DRG neurons. And when we mixed the oleate and palmitate together at a one-to-one -one or two-to-one ratio, we could completely prevent the loss of ATP within these DRG neurons. So we wanted to identify the mechanism behind um, the ability of oleate to prevent uh, mitochondrial dysfunction. And so we predicted that with um, a mixture of oleate and palmitate, both fatty acids are transported into the DRG neuron, and oleate is likely to stimulate the formation of lipid droplets within these DRG neurons. And by doing so, oleate can sequester these saturated fatty acids into lipid droplets preventing downstream mitochondrial dysfunction and lipotoxicity, allowing only for just enough fatty acids to retain normal ATP levels and mitochondrial bioenergetics. In order to test this, we wanted to determine whether lipid droplets were forming in our DRG neurons. So to do this, we used a stain called Nile Red, which labels lipid droplets. Again, we labeled our DRG neurons with mitochondria GFP in order to identify the mitochondria. We then treated the DRG neurons with our various treatments, and then we stained these cells with Nile Red. And what you can see is while many other cells pick up the Nile Red, in the BSA control and palmitate treatments, you can see that there are very few lipid droplets within the axons of these DRG neurons. But when we treat the DRG neurons with oleate or mixtures of oleate and palmitate, you can see that there are these tiny little lipid droplets in the axons. And if we zoom in, you can see that these lipid droplets appear yellow. And we are predicting that this is because the mitochondria are associating with the lipid droplets in order to facilitate uh, more efficient mitochondrial bioenergetics. And when we quantitated this data, we found that the oleate treatments alone or mixtures of oleate and palmitate 
a two to one ratio had a significant increase in the number of lipid droplets per DRG neuron. We also then evaluated mitochondria and lipid droplet interactions and found that in those same conditions, we saw a significant increase in mitochondria inter interacting with these lipid droplets. We next wanted to evaluate the effect of these fatty acids on apoptosis. And what we found was that only um, across all these various physiological concentrations had no impact on apoptosis. So it did not cause an increase in caspase 37 oct activity. However, palmitate caused a dose-dependent increase in caspase 37 activity, suggesting that it induced apoptosis. And when we mixed the two fatty acids together at an equal molar or two to one ratio, you can see we could completely prevent that apoptosis in our DRG neurons. Therefore, so far, I have told you that it's likely that the elevated level of saturated fatty acids in the SFA-rich high-fat diet um, leads to metabolic dysfunction and peripheral neuropathy by impairing mitochondrial trafficking, bioenergetics, and ATP production in sensory DRG neurons in vitro. We also show that palmitate induces apoptosis in these sensory DRG neurons in vitro. And we predict that the monounsaturated fatty acid-rich high-fat diet that restores nerve function in pre-diabetic murine models is able to protect mitochondrial trafficking and function through the formation of lipid droplets. We also show that oleate was able to prevent apoptosis in sensory neurons in vitro. So this led us to ask two new important questions. So we've looked at these changes in vitro and we see changes in nerve function in vivo. So how can we translate this from our cell studies into our murine studies? And so the main questions we're asking now are how, do these, how does the SFA-rich high-fat diet drive peripheral neuropathy in vivo? And how does the MUFA-rich high-fat diet restore nerve function in vivo? In the interest of time, I will focus on the first question. So in order to address this question, we wanted to identify lipid alterations within the nerves of these prediabetic mice that correlate with peripheral neuropathy. We predicted that an elevation of saturated fatty acids, palmitate, and stearate may drive de novo ceramide and syncolipid synthesis. And we know that ceramides induce mitochondrial dysfunction and lipotoxicity. So I'll talk about some of our ongoing studies evaluating changes in ceramides and syncolipids in the sciatic nerve of these murine models of prediabetes and peripheral neuropathy. A second approach that we're taking is we are evaluating untargeted lipidomics of sciatic nerves from these prediabetic mice. And the goal here is to identify changes in global lipid classes within the sciatic nerve. As uh, preliminary experiments for evaluating ceramides and sphingolipids in the sciatic nerve of these prediabetic mice, we performed another dietary intervention paradigm. This time we had five groups of mice. The first two groups of mice were fed a standard diet um, at either, until either 16 weeks of age or 24 weeks of age. The groups three and four were fed a high fat diet until either 16 or 24 weeks of age. And the fifth group was fed the high fat diet until they developed neuropathy at 16 weeks of age, at which point these mice were switched to a standard diet until 24 weeks of age. We, at the termination of the study, we then evaluated their nerve function, looking at nerve conduction velocity and intraepidermal nerve fiber density. And what we found is the high fat diet at both 16 weeks of age and 24 weeks of age resulted in a significant reduction in both sensory and motor nerve conduction velocities. We also found that the mice that were switched from a high fat diet to a standard diet had a complete restoration of both sensory and nerve conduction and motor nerve conduction velocities we saw a similar trend for intraepidermal nerve fiber density. Since we had previously published untargeted lipidomics in another study, we took those lipidomic results and had them reanalyzed to determine whether there were changes in ceramides. And what we found was in the mice that were fed a high fat diet until 16 weeks of age had a slight increase in the total ceramide levels within their sciatic nerves. The mice that were fed a high fat diet until 24 weeks of age had a much higher increase in their total ceramide levels. And in the mice that were switched back to the standard diet, you can see that they had a reversal in their total ceramide levels within the sciatic nerve. We next wanted to determine whether there were any specific changes in species of ceramides. And so we generated heat maps from the sciatic nerves of these mice. And what we found was that 
in the standard diet control, there were certain ceramide species that were much lower, and that when these mice were fed a high fat diet until 16 weeks of age, they had an increase in certain ceramide species. And this increase became even more distinct in the mice that were fed a high fat diet for 24 weeks of age. And then in the mice that were switched back to a standard diet, you can see that there was a reversal of the level of these ceramides back towards the standard diet control. There were also some ceramides that had an opposite pattern. They were higher in the standard diet control mice, lower in the high fat diet fed mice, and then reversed back to the standard diet control level in the mice that had been switched back to a standard diet. So we are currently performing targeted sphingolipid lipidomics in order to validate these preliminary studies and identify the absolute level of ceramides within these different mouse models. We also performed untargeted lipidomics in order to evaluate whether there are changes in global lipid classes in the sciatic nerves of these high fat diet fed mice with peripheral neuropathy. In a separate cohort, we fed these mice either a controlled diet, a standard diet, or a high fat diet. And what was really interesting is when we generated heat maps of these different lipid classes, you can see that there's a very different profile in the sciatic nerve of the control standard diet fed mice compared to the high fat diet fed mice. What we found too is that for many of these different lipid classes, triglycerides, diacylglycerols, phosphatidylethanolmines, and phosphatidylcholines, we saw a distinct shift in chain length of these um, different lipid classes. So we're very interested in pursuing that in the future. Additionally, we found that there was a distinct reduction in sphingomyelin and in cardiolipin within the nerves of these high fat diet fed mice compared to the standard diet control fed mice. And this is particularly interesting because phosphatidylethanolamines, phosphatidylserine, and cardiolipin are all very, very important for mitochondrial function. Cardiolipin is localized in the inner mitochondrial membrane of the mitochondria and allows for appropriate organization of those electron transport complexes in order to produce ATP. So we're excited about pursuing these results further. I also want to tell you about some of our ongoing studies where we are determining whether we can see similar changes that we see in the pre-diabetic mirroring models in patients with type 2 diabetes and neuropathy. To do this, we're determining whether patients with type 2 diabetes and neuropathy have similar changes in their plasma lipids. Additionally, we wanted to determine whether plasma metabolites um, that may have an impact on mitochondrial function are also altered in patients with type 2 diabetes and neuropathy. So the objective of this study was to identify metabolites that correlate with diabetic polyneuropathy or DPN in type two diabetic patients from the Addition Denmark study. The Addition Denmark study was a cross-sectional and case control study that evaluated type two diabetic patients with screen detected type two diabetes. These patients either had DPN or no DPN, and then there was also a healthy control cohort. So for this study, we submitted plasma from a subset of the patients from the Danish cohort of the Addition Denmark study to Metabolon for mass spectrometry. By doing this, we were able to evaluate the global metabolomic changes in the plasma from these type two diabetic patients. Once we received the metabolomic data, we processed it through our bioinformatic pipeline. This data was first processed through quality check and pre-processing, and then we performed a univariate and multivariate analysis. In the interest of time, I will just talk about the multivariate feature selection analysis called elastic net. And I will also describe our characterization of the total lipid species in the plasma from these type 2 diabetic patients. And finally, I will propose a mechanism. So the patients from the addition Denmark in this study were attending a 13-year follow-up appointment after the initial enrollment in the addition Denmark. They received anthropometric measurements, DPN assessment, and blood sample collection, and the patients underwent DPN characterization using nerve conduction um, study criteria by Dick et al. And what you can see is that the type 2 diabetic patients had a significant increase in BMI, weight, waist circumference, and HbA1c compared to the healthy control subjects. The type 2 diabetic patients also had a significant decrease in HDL cholesterol compared to the healthy controls. 
we first um, wanted to determine whether there was a change in overall lipid, or sorry, overall metabolites between the three different groups. So in the metabolomic analysis, we identified 916 metabolites. And um, what we found using a principal component analysis is that type 2 diabetic patients, regardless of DPN status, were shifted away from the healthy controls shown in pink. But since we wanted to identify metabolites that were altered between type 2 diabetes and type 2 diabetes DPN patients, we performed a multivariate analysis called elastic net. And by doing so, we were able to identify eight metabolites that were significantly altered between the type 2 diabetic patients and patients, type 2 diabetic patients with DPN. What we found was there were five metabolites that were significantly downregulated in patients with DPN and three metabolites that were significantly upregulated. Of these eight metabolites, we were interested in the fact that we found four metabolites that were related to mitochondria or lipid metabolism. These were citrate, hemenuyl carnitine, and acetyl beta alanine, and isoursa deoxycholate sulfate. Based on the fact that these metabolites may affect lipid metabolism or mitochondrial metabolism, we next wanted to determine whether there were changes in these type 2 diabetic patient plasmas um, in lipid profiles. So we first evaluated the plasma free fatty acids. Just as a reminder, on the left, you can see that saturated fatty acids have a linear hydrocarbon chain structure due to the lack of double bonds, whereas unsaturated fatty acids can have a single double bond or more double bonds. What we found was in the healthy control, you can see that there were very few saturated long chain fatty acids. You can see, though, that there is an increase in very long chain fatty acids. In the type 2 diabetic patients, regardless of DPN status, we found that the fatty acids shifted towards an abundance of saturated long-chain fatty acids, similar to what we have seen in our pre-diabetic mirroring models. We next wanted to evaluate changes in complex lipids, similar to our um, pre-diabetic mirroring models where we evaluated untargeted lipidomics. And what we found was in type 2 diabetic patients, there was an increase in both diacylglycerols and phosphatidylethanolamines compared to the healthy control subjects. And this increase became even more distinct in patients that had type 2 diabetes and DPN. We also found that phosphatidylcholine, thingamyelin, ceramide, and acylcarnitines became reduced in type 2 diabetic patients compared to the healthy controls. And this reduction, again, became even more distinct in patients that had DPN. So this is very interesting to us because these changes in the plasma of these type 2 diabetic patients mirrors what we have seen in our pre-diabetic mirroring models within the sciatic nerve. In addition, we identified three lipid metabolites that were significantly altered between type 2 diabetic patients and type 2 diabetic patients with DPN. We found that these were a sphingolipid and two acylcarnitines. Um, so we're very interested in sphingolipid metabolism as well as mitochondrial metabolism. So we concluded that we were able to identify eight plasma metabolites that were unique to patients with type 2 diabetes and DPN. We also found that the plasma-free fatty acid profile moved towards an abundance of long-chain saturated fatty acids. So um, an overload of saturated fatty acids could induce mitochondrial dysfunction and lipotoxicity. We also find that plasma complex lipids were profoundly impacted in type 2 diabetic patients with DPN. This included an elevation in diacylglycerols and phosphatidylethanolamines. This suggests that an elevation in saturated fatty acids may lead to an increase in diacylglycerols, which can then lead to an increase in phosphatidylethanolamines through the Kennedy pathway. This alteration in the level of phosphatidylethanolamines compared to the reduction in phosphatidylcholines is known to impact mitochondrial function and may induce mitochondrial dysfunction within the nerve. We also found that there was an elevation in anacetyl beta alanine in type 2 diabetic patients with DPN. Since anacetyl beta alanine is a precursor for malonyl CoA, which is a potent inhibitor of carnitine palmitoyl transferase, this could prevent the import of saturated fatty acids, reducing the level of acylcarnitines and citrate in the TCA cycle and this could lead to an overall mitochondrial dysfunction within the sciatic nerve. And with that, I would like to thank the fellow
Feldman Lab, uh, my mentor, Dr. Eva Feldman, as well as many of the technicians who have helped with all of the mouse work on these studies. Um, I would also like to thank the Diabetes Focus Group in the Feldman Lab, as well as Stephen Lentz of the Michigan Morphology and Imaging Analysis Corps. He helped to establish the mitochondrial trafficking study analyses. I'd also like to thank my research students who prefer to be referred to as Team Mitochondria and uh, the Michigan Metabolomics Corps, as well as the Michigan Mouse Metabolic Phenotyping Center. I'd also like to thank Annette Hope for um, the kind gift of the 50B11 DRG neurons, as well as my K99 R00 committee. And I would also like to thank all of the authors and collaborators on um, the addition study. And last but not least, I would like to thank the funding that supported all of this work. Um, I've been fortunate to be funded by the NIH throughout my postdoc, as well as a DIACOP award, which provided funding for the initial monounsaturated fatty acid studies. And I would also like to thank the um, funding for Eva Feldman's lab, as well as for the addition study. And last but not least, thank you so much for attending my talk, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Amy, for the excellent presentation. Um, yeah, we do indeed have uh, uh, some questions, and there's more coming in. So the first question um, is regarding your mitochondrial motility assay. Mm -hmm. um, you ran, you showed data from uh, uh, mice on normal diet, and the question is, have you done uh, similar mitochondrial imaging on mice that were fed uh, the high-fat diet? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes, we have. So we don't actually see any changes in mitochondrial trafficking in neurons from high-fat diet fed mice. And we think that that may be because when you extract the neurons and plate them in um, a dish and then give them basal media while the axons extend in the dish, um, we think that they're taken out of that high fat environment. And so for several days before we treat them with fatty acids, they are um, free from that high fat diet environment and have um, a lower level of fatty acids. And so they're able to restore that mitochondrial trafficking. Okay, another question is related to uh, the cultures treated with the palmitate. Uh, you did report an increase in uh, apoptosis. Did you see a reduction in the number of neurons in the cultures? And I guess a corollary question is if you actually have neuronal death, uh, how would you explain uh, the relatively rapid uh, uh, restoration of, of phenotypes that you observed in vivo? Right. Uh, once you switch from the high-fat diet to the, to the MOFA or, or MOFA high-fat uh, mixed diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so these initial studies were done in vitro with an immortalized DRG neuron cell line. Um, so the, the trafficking studies and the TMRM studies were done in primary DRG neurons from mice, and then the ADP and um, cast based analyses were done in 50B11 immortalized DRG neurons. And the reason for that is um, when you do a culture with uh, or from mice, it, you tend to have a spread of different cell types. Um, and so in order to perform these ATP assays, we needed a homogenous uh, population of cells. Um, and so um, I don't think it's necessarily the most accurate represent representation of what's happening in vivo. Um, in order to study that, we're going to be doing some tunnel staining to try to translate these in vitro studies into our mirroring models of prediabetes. And that's part of my K99 grant is to um, determine whether we're seeing um, changes in apoptosis in these DRG neurons. And the other consideration, too, as well for the sciatic nerve is that you have other cell types, such as Schwann cells, that might also be under be undergoing um, apoptosis. So I think it's a, a very complex system, and I think that perhaps studying it in a dish is not the best way, and that is maybe leading us to look more in vitro in our animal models. Okay. Um... Another question is, uh, you mentioned physiological concentrations of fatty acids. Uh, is this uh, plasma physiological concentrations, or can you also measure uh, fatty acids concentration locally in the tissues? Right, yeah. So, um, so we are trying to do that with our targeted and untargeted lipidomics. 
Um, but based on some previous murine studies, we selected these concentrations of fatty acids um, because they were believed to be um, physiological. And this is typically the range that is used in a lot of diabetic studies. It's very tricky to work with fatty acids because based on when you eat a meal, you'll have an elevation of fatty acids, whereas when you are you know, more in like starvation mode or you haven't eaten in a while, then you're going to have a lower level of fatty acids. So a lot of the earlier studies that looked at circulating fatty acids um, did so by you know, looking at feeding time in mice and then evaluating the physiological concentration of these fatty acids in um, plasma. And so this, this range is thought to span um, physiological concentrations in a healthy human, such as 31.25, which is the earlier or the lower um, range of fatty acids, up to 250 micromolar fatty acids. And that's thought to be the physiological range for a diabetic patient. Um, so yeah, and, and hopefully we'll be able to determine the level of these fatty acids within the tissues using our lipidomic approaches. And uh, another question related to the data you presented on uh, patients. Did you distinguish uh, between uh, DPN patients with painful or, or non-painful neuropathy? We did not in this study, no. I think that would be a really interesting thing to do at some point, um, especially because different types of fatty acids are starting to emerge as having different roles in terms of painful neuropathy versus uh, loss of sensation. Um, and so I think that will be a very interesting way that the field will move in the future, but we were not able to differentiate that in this particular study. Okay. Um, I have uh, one question. Actually, your group has published over the year really groundbreaking work on the role of insulin, hyperinsulinemia, and insulin resistance in diabetic neuropathy. Um, have you looked at the interactions between um, the fatty acids, the, the, the saturated fatty acids, and, and insulin and hyperinsulinemia in these in vitro and in vivo models? We have not done that yet. Um, that is a very good point. Yeah, we are hoping to do that in the future, especially with the OLE8 model to determine whether there are any changes in insulin. Um, more so right now, we've uh, focused on impaired glucose tolerance um, and body fat mass because we find that that tends to correlate well in our pre-diabetic and type 2 diabetic models with neuropathy progression. But I think insulin is a will be a very interesting thing to pursue in the future. Yeah. Another question is uh, if you have looked uh, at the impact of dietary supplements, in particular. Uh, resveratrol on uh, on these conditions. We have example done mitochondrial that. transport. Okay. Yeah, we have not done that yet. We have looked at mitochondrial uncouplers, and we did not see a change in the progression of neuropathy in these murine models. Um, so yeah, I think it'll be interesting once we identify what the exact molecular changes are in in vivo, I think we can start to identify drug treatments that we could use to determine whether that will change peripheral neuropathy progression in these mirroring models. Uh, one more question is, uh, have you looked at diabetic mice on a standard diet? Uh, um, di oh, um, so we have done that, yes. Or there are actually some other groups who have done that. Um, so there are several models that have looked at type 1 diabetes um, and using SDZ treatment. And um, yeah, they are able to um, identify changes in peripheral neuropathy in those mice as well. One of the, one of the things that Eva um, is trying to understand is this discrepancy between type 1 diabetes where changing the level of glucose um, for, for type 1 diabetic patients can improve peripheral neuropathy, but in type 2 diabetes that appears to have much less of an effect. And so we're trying to understand that discrepancy between the um, two different types of diabetes. 
And uh, another question is, you present a lot of data on uh, MOFAs, but have you looked at polyunsaturated uh, fatty acids? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we we have started to look at certain polyunsaturated fatty acids. So we have started to look at linoleic acid, which is actually um, very interesting. Um, what we find is that linoleic acid retains mitochondrial function, but it impairs mitochondrial trafficking, similar to palmitate. So um, we're trying to figure out what the mechanism me mechanism is behind that right now. Um, but it's very interesting because the mitochondria retain mitochondrial membrane potential and um, they're able to have a normal level of ATP production and there is no caspase activation in DRG neurons treated with linoleic acid. However, they do have an impairment in mitochondrial trafficking. So um, we're trying to, to figure out the molecular changes that are altering trafficking and are the same between palmitate and linoleic acid um, compared to oleate. Yeah. And uh, one last question is, uh, in the animals uh, fed the high saturated fat diet, do you see evidence, in vivo evidence of uh, uh, peripheral uh, nerve degeneration, like loss of sensations or increased pain sensitivity in the paws? Yes, so um, we have done some hind paw and von Frey analyses, and um, the hind paw is a little bit tricky with the mice because there is some, some variation, but um, we do see um, sometimes significant and sometimes trending differences in hind paw withdrawal and also with von Frey analyses. All right, well, um, one more. Um, okay. Have you looked at changes in myelin between uh, saturated fatty acid diet and, and MOFAS diet? We have not yet. I Yeah, I think that would be a very interesting thing to do in the future, but we have not had a chance to do that yet. So hopefully soon. Okay. All right, very well. I will thank uh, Amy and all the attendees to this uh, webinar and uh, hope to have you online uh, again uh, next week for our next webinar. Thank you. Bye. Awesome. Thank you so much.